All right, today I'm going to do a study on these two flags right here behind me. Um, these two flags are, first of all, you have the national flag of Israel, and then you have the flag of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, that's what this means here in Hebrew. This is Jerusalem. Okay, they, they read, of course, from the right to the left, unlike English, which reads from the left to the right. But uh, these two flags right here actually prophesy the future of the Jewish people. It's a very interesting study. And uh, this one here, the Israeli flag, was adopted uh, on October the 28th of 1948 as the official flag of the, the nation of Israel. This one here was adopted in 1949, so approximately a year later. And we're going to look at these two flags in detail, and I'm going to actually show you that they do accurately portray the future, prophesy the future of the nation of Israel. I'm um, going to need a King James Bible for this study because I am a King James Bible believer. I believe that this is the best translation for the English-speaking world. Um, even if you are Jewish and uh, not a Christian, um, it's still, I think, this is a very Jewish-friendly um, Bible. It's made from the um, Masoretic Hebrew text. It's not from the um, Stuttgartensia edition that was brought out by uh, Cattell you know, under the Nazi regime, basically, that a lot of the new versions rely on. So this is, this is a, the King James Bible was a very uh, good Bible. It's, uh, I've, I have different Hebrew Old Testaments up there, Hebrew English Old Testaments that are put out by Jewish organizations, and the King James matches most of those, uh, almost word for word. So King James Bible is a good translation. Um, but uh, we're going to look about this here. Now, first of all, we're going to look... What is the hexagram? What is this symbol right here? The six-pointed star. What is this hexagram all about? Well, I have, I'm going to show this on the overhead camera here, the Jewish Book of Y by Alfred J. Kolach. Okay, now this is written, this guy is a Jew. He's, he's not a Bible-believing Christian. And um, actually, he's a rabbi. Just realized that I'm just looking here at this little inside cover thing here. He's he's actually a rabbi, and he talks about the Star of David. There are two editions of this that I'm aware of. Two editions of the Jewish Book of Why. I have I have both of them, and I've read through most of this one. I'm still working my way through it, but um, very interesting things in here. Okay, and by the way, before I continue, let me just say that um, I am a friend of of Israel. Okay, I am not uh, Jewish. But I very much support the nation of Israel. I know that there's a lot of things that are going on over there that are wicked, that are very much against both Old and New Testaments. But uh, I, I do not teach replacement theology. I do not take the stand with the Catholic Church that Israel is no more and God's done with the nation of Israel. Uh, not at all. Um, so please don't think that anything I say in this, this study today is a, an attack on the Jewish people because I, would, I wouldn't do something like that. Now, let's begin here. We have page 118. What is the Star of David, the Mogan David popular symbol? What is that? The six-pointed star hexagram is called Mo Mogan or Mogan David in Hebrew. The words Mogan David, generally translated as Star of David, literally mean Shield of David. In early times, the hexagram was used by Roman Mosaic pavements as a decorative design without special significance. Its earliest use in a synagogue dates back 1,800 years, when it appeared next to a five-pointed star pentagram. That's kind of a problem. And a swastika on a frieze in the synagogue of Capernaum. In 6th century Italy, the Star of David emblem appeared for the first time on a tombstone. The origin of the Star of David is clouded, and it probably had no connection whatsoever with King David. It didn't. Uh, we do find that between the years 1300 and 1700, Jewish mystics, Kabbalists, used the terms Shield of David and Shield of Solomon interchangeably, usually in connection with discussions about magic. The Star of David occurs as a specifically Jewish emblem in 17th century Prague, where it appeared on the official seal of the community and on printed prayer books. In 1897, it was adopted by the First Zionist Congress as its symbol, and in 1948, it became the central figure in the flag of the new state of Israel. 
Aside from the wide variety of religious articles on which the Star of David is used as ornamentation, it is popular as an article of jewelry, usually attached to a necklace. To most wearers, it is a symbol of identification with the Jewish people. Okay, so there you have it from a Jewish rabbi. He's saying, it's really, we really don't have any scriptural support for the thing, you know, they say it's the Star of David, but it, there's really little proof in, in the Bible saying that David had any kind of a star associated with him. Um, and, you know, that's fine and everything else. But I'm going to show you why I believe that this star right here is an abomination in God's sight. Okay, we're going to look about that in the study today. And uh, definitely going to be some very interesting things here. I was uh, quite intrigued by some of the different uh, references to the word star. There are actually 15 references, I believe, 15 references in the King James Bible to the word star. Interesting number there too, by the way. But, um, you know, this word, we're going to look at every reference in your King James Bible to the word star. So first turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 24. Now, I've said it before, if you do not have a copy of the King James Bible, you can go online, you can look it up, and you can look online, and so you can, when I say turn to Numbers chapter um, 24, you can go to an online edition of the King James Bible and type in Numbers 24, and you can go switch between that tab and the tab with it, where the video is at. So, that way you can follow along, because as a... Bible believer, it's very important to base your truth on the scriptures. And you make sure that a guy like me is not misquoting scripture. Because uh, if you study Satan in the Bible, um, you'll see that oftentimes he'll quote Old Testament scriptures and he'll change a word or two. You know, um, sin entered into the world because Eve added to the word of God. You know, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh, God didn't say you shouldn't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He just said, don't eat from it. She's saying, hey, we're not even allowed to touch it. She added to the word of God. So adding to and subtracting from, I mean, you can add one, one little small word to the text and change the whole meaning. That's why it's important to read along. That's why I stress that so much. Okay, um, being a Bible-believing Christian, I'm held to a standard. You're held to a standard. But when you just have religious traditions and, and things that are passed down orally or even church hierarchy and things like this or hierarchy within a synagogue or something, the, the rabbis ruling over the, the laity and things and nobody really is reading the Bible for themselves, you know, I mean, that, that system can be abused by any people. It can be abused by the Jews. It can be abused by, you know, it can and is abused all the time by Roman Catholicism. You know, uh, they now they, they act like, oh, well, we want the people to read the Bible and things. But, you know, through most of their history, through the Dark Ages and things, they didn't encourage people to read the Bible. In fact, the people, most of the people in Europe were illiterate for a very, very long time. The Catholic priesthood kept it that way. Because you read the Bible, you see that Catholicism has no basis in Scripture, uh, other than twisting things, certain uh, names and things, stealing names from the Bible and basically merging it into their political religious system. So that's why I stress it so much. Um, and I need to say that because, you know, I, I realize I just assume, you know, I have over 630 something videos now here on my channel. And I just assume that people that tune into each video are aware of all the stands that I've taken in all the other 600 plus videos. Uh, not so. There are many people that come along, they're brand new to this thing, and they just think, well, you know, who is this guy, whatever else. And that's why I'm saying, have the scriptures in front of you. You need to study the scriptures and search the scriptures for yourself. And ask for God to lead you and to show you truth. Okay? If you think I'm perfect, an imperfect imperf uh, expositor of strip scripture or something, I never make mistakes. Um, <laughs> that's not true. That's why, again... Scripture, there's the standard. So let's continue here. Matthew, or uh, yeah, Matthew. Numbers chapter 24, verse 15. Very interesting prophecy here. A lot of people miss this. And he took up his parable and said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, he hath said, 
which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance but having his eyes open. I shall see him but not now. I shall behold him but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. And out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Hmm. Very interesting prophecy here. And this is, by the way, the very first time there in verse uh, 17, that's the very first reference to the word star in your King James Bible. Very interesting prophecy there. That there would come a, come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Okay? What's going on there? There would be a king someday. Now, if you're Jewish, you would know him as your Messiah that's going to come. Okay? And I have a whole study on that. Uh, answering a Jewish rabbi's, you know, things about uh, the Messiah and, and Jesus and things like that. I have a whole study on that. Showing that Jesus Christ is the only one that can fulfill the prophecies of the coming Messiah because of the thing of Jeconiah, you know, and, and all the other stuff. I can't get into all that. But the point is, there is a prophecy that there would be a future king that would come out of Israel. And he's called a star. Hmm. You say, well, then that's, that's this right here. That's depicting this. No, we're going to see about that. This is the star of a false god right there. Next, we're going to go to the next reference to the word star in your, in your Bible here, the King James Bible. At Amos chapter 5. The book of Amos. Amos 5. I probably went past it. Amos chapter 5, verse 21 through 27. Okay, it says here, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them, neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Kion, Kion, however you say that, your images, now look at this, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Hmm. So there is a star that's prophesied as being the Messiah, the coming Messiah. But the Jews make these wicked Jews that are in apostasy or that are, that are in sin, not I shouldn't even say apostasy, they're in sin, they're, they're wicked, they're rejecting God, and they make their own God. They make their own star. Kind of like that. And we're going to see the significance, too, of the number six. And how occultists of all different types and, and, you know, groups use that star. This is a pagan star. That's not the star of the coming Messiah. The coming Jewish Messiah. And by the way, he already did come in the person of Jesus Christ. Pay attention to the study and you'll see I can prove it. Next go to Matthew. Next reference to the word star in the Bible here. Matthew chapter 2. <coughs> Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We'll read that. Okay, it says here, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Let me stop there for just a minute. They didn't see the star that they were in the west and they saw it over in the east. Okay. They were in the east, and they saw the star. Kind of like me saying, I saw a deer in my house. 
Well, uh, I didn't see a deer literally in my living room. I was in my house when I saw the deer. Okay, see how that works? We saw the star in the east, and we were come to worship him. So they're traveling from the west to the east. Okay, and if you do the geography there, basically they're coming from a uh, Babylon type of area there where, uh, you know, the ancient city of Babylon would have been, and they're traveling to Jerusalem, east. They're heading east. Verse 3, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Hmm. You'd think that they'd be excited about the king of the Jews showing up. No, they didn't want to have their little political authority you know, overthrown there. Verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately, or, excuse me, privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had to, uh, heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, get a hold of this one, till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Why do they... First of all, why are they traveling over there, you know, to Jerusalem? What's the deal with this star? And why do they have exceeding great joy? You know why? Because the prophecy that's given back there in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, that prophecy is being fulfilled. That star that comes out of Jacob, that scepter out of Israel, they're seeing it happen. The king is being born. They see it. But I want you to notice, so first of all, you see there the, the prophecy there, the star out of Jacob has just been born. But notice a couple interesting things there. Verse, uh, where is it? Verse 9. The star which they saw in the east went before them. Now, according to our modern day science, you got to look out for that. <laughs> According to the modern day science, stars are basically gaseous, you know, balls of energy that are that are burning and they're burning up and they get smaller and smaller with time. Now, how can you have a star, gaseous matter, move through the heavens, leading people to the place where Jesus Christ is born? And then it says there, and stood over where the young child was. How does that work? And by the way, you know, Jesus was born and, you know, it says he's a young child here. It wasn't that he was just a, you know, just newborn baby. I should clarify that. I'm sorry if I made it sound like he was just a newborn baby. You know, this was probably a few years after, you know, he was actually born. But the point is, this star moves and guides these wise men and then it stands over top of where Jesus Christ was. What was the star? Gaseous ball of energy? No. This is the interesting thing. The star was an angel. You say, an angel? You're calling a star an angel. Let's look about this. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. Are angels ever called stars in the Bible? Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. It says here, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So, stars are called angels. Interesting. Very interesting. But by the way, notice the number there, the significance of the number. Seven. 
not six. Turn over to Revelation chapter 13. You say, well, uh, I'm not really familiar with the argument that you're trying to make here, Brian. Okay, Revelation chapter 13. You can read the whole thing on your own there if you want to sometime. But um, verse 15, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image, or that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the number or the name of the beast or the number of his name. What's the number of his name? Keep reading. Verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is seven. No, that's God's number. His number is 603 score and six. And if you do a study in the Old Testament, you see that in one year, King Solomon, the, the amount of talents of gold that he received was 603 score and six. One, two, three, four, five, six. How could a six-pointed star make it onto the national flag of Israel? And by the way, if you look at it this way, there's a six, there's a six, there's a six. It's two sets of three sixes. Hmm, interesting. Okay, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six total lines make up a hexagram. That thing's filled with six, six, six. Hmm. Interesting. Now let's. Uh, well, let me just let me just look up a verse real quick here. I forgot. I didn't put this in the study, but the Lord just kind of. Stuck this thing in my mind. I want to make sure where it's at here. Okay, Revelation chapter 9, 11. 9, 1, 1, kind of interesting. It says here, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Hmm. And if you read the book of Revelation, this, this angel of the bottomless pit there, basically is the spirit that is behind the Antichrist. Hmm. So he's an angel. And we saw that angels are represented as stars. And the Jews in the Old Testament, in the book of, of uh, Amos, had a star representing a false god. Hmm. How interesting. Turn next to Acts chapter 7. You'll see the next reference in the Bible to star. Acts chapter 7, verse 37. Okay. Acts 7, verse 37 through 43. We're going to read these verses. It says here, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust him from them and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt. In other words, the false gods. Saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. Hmm. Remember that. The host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Remphan. Hmm, interesting. It was Keun back in Amos. Now it's Remphan. 
Very interesting. Figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Hmm. How very interesting. So you have a... The Jewish people, they're told, wait for the Lord, you know, and, and you're going to have the Ten Commandments and everything else, and God's going to deliver you from the hand of the Egyptians. And what do they do? They make a false god that comes back, you know, goes back to Egypt. They make this, they raise up this false god, this golden calf. Now God says, you know, in the future, hey, there's going to be this prophesied king that's going to come to you, this this Messiah that's going to come, that's going to sit on the throne of David, a star that rises out of Jacob, a scepter out of Israel. And what do they do? They raise up a false Messiah, an antichrist, a man that has a spirit of an, he's an angel there. And Abaddon, Apollyon is his name, the angel of the bottomless pit, represented by a star. Six pointed star when they're supposed to wait for Jesus Christ their coming king and it is Jesus Christ by the way if you're you know rejecting that and saying oh, I don't believe it's Jesus Christ you're going to see by the end of the study that it is in fact Jesus Christ and in fact your own flag tells you so very interesting but let's continue 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 39 through 44. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, and another, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies... Where's the celestial? Up there in the heavens. You know, remember the host of heaven? The Lord says, you know, or back there, and Stephen is speaking to the Jews and things, and he says, God gave you up to worship the host of heaven. And we saw that angels are called stars as well. Let's continue reading here. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Hmm. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Okay? This whole chapter here is talking about the resurrection. It's very, very interesting some of the things that are being said in there. But again, you're seeing that there are celestial bodies and angels are mentioned. Okay? Stars are mentioned there. Hmm. Very interesting. And, you know, you say, well, Brian, I just believe that, you know, science has taught us that stars are gaseous balls of energy. Okay, can you call that, say that that's a, a body? I don't know about that. Turn next to Luke chapter 2, the story of the birth of Christ. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 15. It says here, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed, shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So you see a bright light associated with the angel of the Lord. Our stars, do they give off bright light? Mm -hmm. Verse 10, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, 
praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let me just stop right there for a minute. It's very, very interesting there. Back in Acts chapter 7, they are given up to worship the host of heaven. Here you have it saying, uh, There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God. What was the heavenly host? Oh, there's a whole bunch of angels up there. That's what we see in the paintings and stuff that come out at Christmas time. You know, you see these paintings and there's all these angels in the heavens and stuff like this. They just, you know, all of a sudden materialized or something like that. What if they're there all the time? What if they're there right now when you go out at night? What if that host of heaven is still there? The stars. Hmm. Interesting. You say, well, Brian, it's just the, the heavenly host. It, it just, it doesn't say angels. Let's keep reading. Verse 15, And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made, unto, made known unto us. So the host of heaven shows up, and then later it says the angels. You say, but there was the angel of the Lord, but then there's angels later on. Interesting stuff there. And you say, well, you, you understand everything that's going on? No, I don't understand everything totally that's going on here. I don't know. It's, it's some very interesting things, some very interesting thoughts, you know. But uh, you see it there again, you know, that this thing of the host of heaven, and then later they end up, ended up calling you know, they're called the angels. Interesting. Let's go to the next reference to the word star. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. It says here, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You would do well if you are Jewish and you are not saved. You would do well to study the New Testament and see the prophecies that have come to pass. As I've stated in another study, I, I saw a video the one time by Rabbi Mordecai Kraft. He's a rabbi at the Hebrew uh, Torah Institute or something in, in New York uh, City, I think it is. And he said that there's only one prophecy in the entire prophecy in the entire New Testament, and it didn't come to pass. I really hate to tell you, but that was said from a very uh, high degree of ignorance. Okay, uh, there are many, many, many prophecies in the New Testament, and they are all coming to pass. And there are many prophecies, prophecies in the Old Testament, and they are coming to pass as well regarding these end times, the book of Daniel, the book of Amos, a lot of the other books. We're going to see about that as we continue today. But just amazing. And you say, well, what's going on there? I don't, I don't really understand what you just read to me there. Well, it says there in verse 19, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed. If you're Jewish, you better take heed to the things that are being spoken of in this, pro or in this sermon today. As unto a light that shineth in a dark place. The nation of Israel right now is under darkness. They have a flag with a false, a depiction of a false god on it. It's like the people that were worshiping the golden calf back there with Moses. God didn't think too highly of the nation of Israel back then at that point. Okay, He said, Moses and Aaron went over here. Hey, who's on the Lord's side? Come over here. And they ended up slaughtering the people that were worshiping the false god. And right now, Israel as a nation is worshiping a false god. Most Jewish people are secular. Their religion is based mostly on traditions and the, the Talmud and, and a lot of these other things that have arisen since the, New Te or the Old Testament was written. A lot of this type of stuff. And the nation of Israel is very, very wicked in a lot of ways. And that's one of the reasons for the coming time of Jacob's trouble. 
a final purification of the nation of Israel, a final purification of the Jewish people to get them ready to receive their king over here. But you say, well, when is that going to happen? When's, when are we going to be able to understand this? Well, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Jesus Christ is the real star that's going to be coming. The star of the show, if you will. We're going to see that as we continue. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25 through 29. Okay, it says here, but that which ye have already hold, uh, that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Who's the morning star? We're going to see as we. You know, and the in the last reference to the word star in your King James Bible. Turn next to Revelation chapter eight. Revelation eight verses one and two. It says here, and when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour, and I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So you see there angels and the number seven again. The number seven is all throughout the book of Revelation. Okay, it's God's number. So you see the seven angels there. Now look down at verse 10. Jump down to verse 10 there in chapter 8. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood, wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Hmm. Now, was that just a star, like a flaming ball or something like this that comes down and hits and poisons the, the rivers? Or was it an angel called wormwood? You say, well, Brian, it just says star. Let's keep reading. Go next to uh, Revelation chapter 9. Down to the next chapter there, Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Wait a second. A star falls from heaven, and the Bible says, him. I don't think it was a ball of gaseous matter. What was it? It was an angel. Hmm. Very clearly an angel compared to a star, called a star. Now we're going to see the most important of all the References to stars in your King James Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. You can turn back there. Revelation 22, verse 16 says here, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Remember back there in Revelation chapter 2, it talked about giving you the morning star. You know, in, over there in, uh, was it second? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it said about the day star. Yeah. So Jesus Christ, who oftentimes appears as the angel of the Lord, um, he is also compared to a star, called a star. And Jesus Christ is the one who fulfilled and will fulfill in the future. He is going to fulfill that prophecy of you know, the star that's come that comes out of Israel or Jacob and the scepter out of Israel back in the book of Numbers. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that prophecy right there. I mean, very clearly. But uh, you say, well, then, but, you know, how do you know that Jesus Christ isn't this? How do you know that this isn't a representative of Jesus Christ? Let's look about that. Acts chapter 17.
Acts chapter 17, verse 29. It says here, for as much then as we ought or as for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Okay? So you're not supposed to make a graven image of the Godhead. Turn back in your Old Testament to Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. The Ten Commandments, when they are given. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So even if you had somebody that whoever created this flag and they said, well, you know, this is representative of our coming Messiah, our coming King, whatever, you know, the star there that's mentioned in Numbers chapter 15 it doesn't work. Okay, because you're not supposed to make any kind of a graven image that refers to the Godhead. Okay, you're not supposed to do that. And so this thing here cannot be symbolic of Jesus Christ. And, and as I've been saying, Jesus Christ is, you know, all through the book of Revelation, it's the number seven associated with Jesus Christ, with God Almighty, the seven spirits of God, the Bible talks about. Okay, back in the book of Isaiah, actually, it talks about the seven spirits of God. Not six. The number six is the number of the Antichrist, the man of sin. This angel the, of the bottomless pit, Abaddon in Hebrew and, and Apollyon in Greek. Right there. That spirit that infests the Antichrist. It's a bad flag to have flying there. But you say, well, you know, I still think it's a good symbol for the Jewish people. Okay. Let's, let's look at some pictures here. First, we have Madame Blavatsky. You can see here she has the hexagram right in the middle of her symbol there, the Ouroboros, the snake biting its own tail with the swastika right above the hexagram. Um, she was before Adolf Hitler, and Hitler was a big admirer of her uh, theosophical nutty nonsense. There you have Britney Spears with the hexagram around her neck. And I don't believe that was because she's a crypto Jew and the Jews control all the media and all this other nonsense. I believe it's because she's into witchcraft. I'm going to show you a picture on that. Here we have this uh, depiction of, it's probably a movie, I guess, but this shows uh, the way a witch will actually use this symbol. They'll put this hexagram in a circle and they write these other stupid things in the corners and whatnot. And they, they conjure up devils in the middle of this. And it's interesting because if you look at the back of your dollar bill, let's see if I have one here. I think I probably do. Yeah, I do. Okay, this will be fine. The back of your dollar bill. Zoom in here. First, you have there Annuit Shapedus Novus Ordo Seclorum, announcing the conception of a new order that's secular without God, in other words. And if you take a, let me take my pencil here, okay, and you go like this to here, down to the O, whoops, messed up that one, and then you take the triangle itself, the pyramid with the all-seeing eye, what do you have? Hexagram. Go over to this side, lo and behold, what do we have here? Another hexagram right there. And this one has the little devil right in the middle. Hmm. And of course, there's all kinds of other, you know, things, significance with the dollar bill. But again, paganism, this hexagram. You want to put a hex on somebody? Then you have this weird thing if you look up on uh, Google Earth or one of these deals out in Nevada, this, this weird symbol here. And uh, I have no idea what that thing is supposed to be, some kind of missile site or whatever, but they made the thing into the shape of a hexagram. Kind of weird. Here you have the Pope, and he's got this mitre on, this hat on, and he's got hexagram there on it. 
interesting too because Ratzinger there, Cardinal Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger, uh, or Joseph Ratzinger if you want to pronounce it the right way, um, he was a member of the Hitler Youth. Of course, he was forced to do it. You know, he was very much against it, I'm sure. Uh, here's another picture of it. You can see a little bit closer up. There are these two hexagrams with, again, something in the middle, kind of like the witches conjuring up a devil in the middle of this, this hexagram. Bad news. And, of course, what other organization would use this thing? Well, the very familiar uh, Masonic Lodge, the square and compass. And, of course, uh, the G in the middle meaning generativity. So you have... Um, I don't exactly have this thing positioned right, but the upward pointing triangle, the triangle that points up like this, that triangle represents the male. The downward pointing triangle represents the female. You put the two together, what do you get? Generativity. Baby's being made, okay? Figure it out. And you say, uh, are there any other groups? Well, how about the uh, Lancaster County Amish uh, I'm from Lancaster County. I was born and raised there, and, and my ancestors go way back, go back to some of that whole Dutch uh, Mennonite type of, of ancestry is what I had. And this was a very common sight when I was little. That uh, A lot of them are starting to repaint this, but a lot of the barns in Lancaster County had hex signs on them. And it was sort of a good luck type of a thing. And you can see here on this barn, um, you can see these hex signs. And it's interesting because they actually had a, a uh, down near the town of Intercourse, um, that was actually a town uh, in Lancaster County, and they actually had this uh, hex barn, and they sold hex signs, all different types of hex signs, and many of them were hexagrams, stylized hexagrams. And this barn just always had trouble. It burned a couple times. It was it, Finally, somebody just, I think they bought it or something, somebody, they sold it, somebody bought it and just closed it to the public. It was right down out of, outside of the town of Intercourse. So, you know, really kind of a strange thing there. Here we have a picture of the Mormon, see if I can get the name of this thing right, the Salt Lake Assembly, um, Assembly Hall. The Salt Lake Assembly Hall is what this thing is. Why do they have a hexagram there in the window? It's uniquely a Jewish symbol. No, it's a uh, symbol of witchcraft. It's a symbol of a false pagan god. And uh, just show you two other things here very quickly. Interesting book that uh, a brother sent me. Got to zoom out here real quick. Saints, the chosen few. <laughs> There's so much ridiculous stuff in this book. It's incredible. But um, let me show you here. They have the wonders of Islam. You wonder how anybody could be so dumb as to be deceived by it. Okay. So I get to the yeah. All right, you have page. What is this? Yep. Page ninety nine. There. Page ninety nine. The wonders of Islam, chapter four. Over here we have this uh, below Muhammad and his companions, this old drawing. And what do we have? Hexagrams. Lots and lots of hexagrams. More hexagrams. Hmm. Interesting. Flip over a few pages here. Here we have the beautifully... Crafted windows of an Indian mosque offers a resting place for two doves. Islamic temples. Hmm. Say that this symbol here, this symbol is the symbol of the Jewish people. No, it's the symbol of the Antichrist. The coming man of sin. Okay. And all the false religions use it. Let me show you one other thing here. We have a Roman Catholic. Uh, here we have the New American Bible Catholic Heritage Edition, Catholic Publishers. On the inside, we have this big, huge Catholic Babel building. And right there, 
you can see up on top of the roof hexagrams interesting that was it yeah right there his holiness pope paul the sixth yeah uh-huh <laughs> burning in hell right now sure Now, you know, the Jews are supposed to be a peculiar people, a people that are separate from the world. I mean, you read the Old Testament, it's just like, don't intermingle with the other kindreds. Don't go over and learn from their gods. Don't go down to Egypt to buy your horses. Don't go to, don't go. God's continually telling the Jewish people, stay separate. I've called you to be a separate people, a chosen generation, a chosen people. Stay separate. Is this staying separate? Your flag is a pagan symbol, condemned in the book of Amos, condemned in the book of Acts. Oh, it's the Star of David, you know, it's a Star of David. You can't find that thing in any edition of any Bible that I'm aware of. You know, I, I have to say that I'm aware of because, you know, Lord knows how many new versions are coming out all the time. There could be one that has come out that actually says Star of David or Seal of Solomon or something like that. I have no idea. But, you know... You have a Jewish rabbi, I showed you in the very beginning, and he said, no, there isn't any kind of scriptural support for this star. So what are you doing messing with it? Well, God is showing you what your future is, if you're Jewish. It's a warning. This is what's coming next. The Antichrist. But, there's another future beyond this. That's what we're going to talk about now. Let's talk about the flag of Jerusalem over here. 